Okay, hi everyone. We are going to start. Apologies that we um, are starting a little bit late. Um, the, the, the venue, whilst they've very kindly hosted us, it is a little bit inconspicuous as well. So anyway, you guys have done really well. You passed the first test, <laughs> okay, of finding the, the, the chambers. So welcome to the activists and uh, legal rights talk that's going to be um, done by two uh, very, very well-versed professionals. We have two barristers in the room with us, Alan Robertshaw and Christabel McCuey. Um, Christabel, firstly, thank you so much for um, hosting us here. This is Christabel's chambers, and they very kindly allowed the talk to take place here. Um, I'm going to allow uh, Alan and Christabel to sort of introduce themselves when they start. Um, my name is Dina Ahern, in case you've not met me before, I've not met you. Um, I'm the co-convener for the SAVE movement. This is baby Ilan, by the way. He is on mute, so it's only fair that he gets an introduction. Um, you may or may not know, but part of my role as co-convener is to, to put together a number of talks, workshops, to assist activists within the SAVE movement. Um, and, and one of those was, of course, this. Um, quite apt at the stage that we're in with an amalgamation of many groups coming together. You must have all heard of Animal Rebellion and the, the action that is soon to take off on the 7th of October. Um, so, you know, knowing your legal rights, knowing your limitations, knowing what the law allows us to do and what it prohibits, what prohibits us to do um, is really useful. Um, there will be space for questions and answers, I'm assuming, so, um, you know, perhaps you can leave those yeah. till towards the end, or as we go along, yeah, whatever, people, whatever people want, okay, um, so yeah, without m further ado, I'm going to just let the two of you start, I don't know who's going first, but I'm going to clear the way, um, I will also just very briefly say thank you for, for um, buying the ticket from Eventbrite, the money is going to be going to an animal sanctuary. This time we've chosen for it to go to Go Vegan World, um, Sandra Higgins. We choose different animal sanctuaries every time. Um, if you have any more spare change that you wish to donate, then please let me know and I can put that together with the other pool of money and we can send that off um, to Sandra Higgins at Go Vegan World. And also, before I forget, if you have any other ideas of any talks or workshops that you would like for the SAVE movement to host, or perhaps you have something that you might want to offer other activists, um, please let me know, contact me on Dina Ahern um, on Facebook and we can talk, we can put something together. Okay, so welcome and thank you for attending. Thank you to Christabel and Alan. Right, let's go on my notes here. Um, thank you for coming. My name's Alan Robertshaw. Um, I'm a barrister, former member of this chambers and rather strangely now back in this chambers but I'm here with my Advocates for Animals hat on. Um, Advocates for Animals is it's the first SRA regulated law firm that concentrates exclusively on animal law. And it was founded by two very talented people, uh, David Eady, both uh, backgrounds in sort of public law, um, campaigning, media type things. And what they did is they got together, they formed this firm and it's to use the law proactively for animal rights. Um, so there's lots of public law type, type things in there, judicial review, they do a lot of freedom of information um, requests and things like that. And that's actually proving sort of very, very interesting because as you'll know, one of the sort of goals people have is tell the truth. Let people know what's going on. And a lot of the time, sort of they'll, you know, they'll, they'll come to the conclusion themselves and they know what's really there. But it's all about access and transparency. Um, so. It's not very glamorous necessarily, it's not quite like they're storming buildings and stuff, but it's plugging away in the background. I mean, Edith's currently tied up in a case that's basically been going on since 2016, and we're now at the appeal stage. They actually succeeded um, against the Home Office and the Information Commissioner um, on basically trying to find out it's why the CPS have not been prosecuting um, some animal research organisations. They managed to find out that there was a review that said we'd had two complaints that we were about to bring to prosecution, but for some reason they didn't go ahead but to find out why. Um, it's all sort of very exciting and sort of interesting things. Um, as to what I'm going to talk about, we're big believers in diversity at Goldsmiths Chambers. Now, we know a lot of people like 
Um, so very coherent things, logic, well thought out presentations with excellent notes and slides and proper explanations. <coughs> but I also like to cater to the demographic that likes sort of just rambling stream of consciousness type <laughs> <laughs> um, So that's why, that's, what, that's why I'm here. And this is what I'm calling Activism Law and Miscellany. I'm just going to do the warm up. Chris Fall's going to do the uh, sort of main thing. This is a sort of series of quite random, disjointed topics, but they're all things that people have genuinely asked me about. Uh, in terms of with animal rights and things. And what I'm trying to do is, there's lots of people here, I expect you all sort of you know, take part in things, but there may be people here who are organising, and as um, some animal rebellion and organisations like that, apparently uh, they're technically holocracies, or sometimes people say they're not, and I must confess the first time I heard that, they said, well, we're holo you know, when Dan said, we're a holocracy, I went, hmm, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can see how that works. But the fact is that there'll be lots of organisation at local levels. So what we need to look at is not just the sort of liability for when you're out there on the street. What about the liability for when you're organising things? Because, you know, d d make no mistake, there are certain organisations and companies and corporate interests and things. They will come after you as organisers. And we can talk about all the sort of criminal side of things as well, but... There's also like a lot of civil <coughs> issues that you need to know about. Now, part of my background is my sins, and I'm very much, uh, I don't know if it's poacher turned gamekeeper or gamekeeper turned poacher, um, down in Cornwall. I was the resident counsel for the fishing industry, so if you read on the Greenpeace thing, when we did a case uh, down there, it's quite funny, because I managed to, there was a big conspiracy down there, and uh, it ended up with a one pound fine. Um, <laughs> they started off with a conditional discharge, but for technical reasons that wasn't allowed, so it was a one pound fine. And we've got a thing, Greenpeace wrote a big article saying uh, eco-terrorism, and it said, this just goes to show what you can get away with if you have clever lawyers. And my instructing solicitors literally put on their website the next day, clever lawyers, Greenpeace. <laughs> <laughs> put them down as a legal 500 reference. Uh, that's what you, I think that's what now the kid's called trolling. Um, but one thing we're trying to do is to bring the same sort of weaponized, the weaponized use of the law, the same sort of strategic litigation we use in corporate issues to activism, to be proactive. There's a, and I understand within activism, there's quite a lot of suspicion about the law. You know, it's the establishment, it's not on our side, everybody's against it. And uh, not saying that's not necessarily true, but you can use the law proactively. You, you know, it, it's time to stop being, perhaps being sort of reactive and defensive and looking at oh, how, you know, what's your rights on a demo and things. We can start being awkward to people. We can start sort of bringing cases. We can, I mean, there's all the public order, uh, public <coughs> law stuff, like say, like digital review and things and freedom of information. But it's the use, use of sort of limited companies. It's a way of protecting exposure. Set up a single purpose vehicle that basically takes the hit on costs or risk, things like that. That's what, that's what businesses do. Businesses, mm. it's all about risk taking, but they don't put any skin in the game themselves. They will create a single purpose entity they will use that to do whatever project they're working on at the time. If it all goes well, hooray, we're all in gravy. If it goes wrong, well, there you go. Feel free to wind up that company. Um, and you probably notice that there's an Animal Rebellion Limited out there at the moment. Um, so again, that's something we can be uh, we can be looking at. Now, I'm a big fan of what's called <laughs> the Socratic method. So feel free, ooh, feel free to just chat and ask because I don't want to concentrate too much on the black letter law. I can sort of go on about this is what the relevant act says. You need to know what's going to happen in practice. What do the police do? What do the CPS do? What's going on in the background with the pressure from the government? We're quite lucky at the moment. The current commander of the Met is not going to stick his neck out. We, you, you can find out this information. Because of what happened in 2007 with Ian Tomlinson, he has literally said, I am not basically being there taking the hit. Uh, if you want me to police these things, Times have changed. It's for you to get new legislation. Now, there's sort of things happening in government at the moment. I'm, I, I don't read the newspapers or watch. I'm too pretentious to have television. But apparently there's lots of things going on in government that are distracting. <laughs> um, it's really annoying because, just to go you know, for the animals, the various animal welfare bills, uh, when the prorogation came in, they all got kicked into touch. Uh, we've got the FINS law about the service dogs. Uh, the service dogs, you know, that's the one that basically stopped police dogs being property and said, no, they're creatures and if you sort of you know, attack a police dog, then we're going to come down on you. But there's also the Sentencing uh, Act and there's also the Animal Sentience, which ironically is one of the few bits of 
post-Brexit things that does incorporate some EU law, Article 14, Recognition of Animal Sentience, into domestic law. They got kicked into touch because obviously putting up prorogation, basically pressing the reset button, mm. like, you know, set to factory default. So luckily, they are now revived again. So fingers crossed, because there's cross-party support, you know, they might get done. But anyway, that's enough sort of semi-rambling. This is all about informed consent. If you're going to go out there, especially if you're going to appeal to kids, and it's a very youth-driven movement, there's lots of people, you need to know what you're letting yourself in for, but you also need, it's only fair that you explain to people what they're letting themselves in for, because it's all very well going, yeah, fantastic, we were down, we had a great time, I got arrested, I proved my point, <laughs> and then they go to university, and I'm sorry, you can't be on this course, because this course has an element of um, you a year in Japan or whatever, you won't be allowed in, because of your conviction, so you, you can't get on this course. What about employment law? You know, it's like, yeah, this was really good. You go in, the employer says, I saw you on the news last night, sorry, corporate image, every recognised you, you know, you know our client base, we can't have you. Um, what about if you're over here, especially post-Brexit, what's your immigration status? What's your visa say about sort of good character and good behaviour and not getting arrested? You know, minor public order offence. Um, remember the guy who jumped in the Thames for the boat race and things? So you've got to be very, very careful. So it's only fair that you let people know about this. And these are some of the areas that I want to look at. Criminal liability, employment, academic, travel, which is including sort of, you know, immigration status, especially post-Brexit. But anyway, let's have a look um, at some of the detail. Okay, so you're out and about, you're at the demo, and the police arrest you. Now, Christopher's gonna talk about all the sort of public order offences aspect. Okay, so she can tell you about what sort of offences you're looking at. But how are they going to deal with you at the police station? I mean, I don't know, anybody here been arrested? Yay. <laughs> <laughs> for, any, for anything sort of related to this, it's like, yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. We got drunk and stole that car that time. It was in South Africa and here. Yeah, so I've been arrested in two countries. Good. Yeah. Well, <laughs> as you probably know, yeah, the South African situation. I mean, in the 80s. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, so... Lots of Tom Robinson, British police are the best in the world, but I don't believe those stories I've heard. But um, yeah, I mean, obviously there's going to be a slight difference. There's a little bit of a difference. Yes. <laughs> um, but even so, there are consequences. Now, it's fair to say that the police were on the Animal Rights March and the police were as nice as pie. Uh, those of us who were, our little group, we were so far at the back, we practically qualified for police overtime because we were, we were actually, <laughs> at, one stage, at one stage, we were behind the vans following the march. And they were going, could you just move up a little bit, please? And it's like, no, we want to talk to the dogs. I get myself arrested at one of these events in London. No, they uh, 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 just didn't want to arrest him. No, I was just taking a very, oh, whatever the opposite of proactive is, he's basically sitting there going, I am not, basically, I don't care what the Daily Mail says about you letting these people get away with it, I am not going to be the one holding the can, uh, because it, it doesn't matter, now, you're instantly on social media, and with editing and things like that, you, you know, they, 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 they can look bad, so basically they are going, we're going to sit there, it's like um, when we were chatting about when they did the reforesting in Parliament Square, it's like, what could happen, what could happen, and we did have a little bet and said, Basically, I suspect nothing will happen. And it was literally one of the guys from Parliamentary Estate wandered over and said, I've got to tell you that you're not allowed to do that. And then one of them basically, <laughs> basically walked back in. The police, uh, you know, there's a lot of police in that area. And they, they, it's almost like they deliberately took a policy just not to even walk over. And just like leave them to it and just clean up afterwards. Awesome. Of course. Um, but live exports at Ramsgate, they're yes. still arresting people there for minor yes. offences. Is that because it's different police authorities? Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah, um, this is the thing, because you've got to understand how lo local politics works, and this is why, maybe getting, you know, something that's beyond the scope of this, but get involved, because who are the sort of people become local councillors and police commissioners and, and things? People with a, an interest in that sort of thing. tend not to be necessarily the sort of people who are doing it for community reasons and things like that. Mm -hmm. Undoubtedly there are, mm -hmm. but yeah. Um, there seems to be a lot of confusion over what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed mm -hmm. to do, and within the police as well. Uh, there are. Uh, they, 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 you know, public order is a very, very sort of difficult and tricky topic. And also it's one where you've got an interface of criminal law and private law, lots of injunctions, lots of quasi-civil stuff. And one thing we'll look at is what we call um, these new public spaces protection orders, uh, which is, well, yeah. Which is interesting. They evolved out of the old dog walking orders from the council. 
So there is a bit of an animal connection there, but that is literally how they started. They started with people going, professional dog walkers are annoying people, and they introduced this power to put a limit on how many dogs you could walk, and it sort of grew from there. So, I mean, in some places they still call dog walking orders. But um, there's that recent case, and we'll chat about that at the uh, in Enfield at the abortion clinic, and the case that's come back on that has given us a lot of guidance as to what will happen. And I suspect we might see more use of PSTOs against demonstrations um, because there's something that li literally the local authority can impose and they could do it now. I suspect you might get something the night before where they'll go, by the way, there's a PSPO on that area because by the time you challenge it, it's all over. And the, the local authority can do it pretty much on a whim. They've got to liaise with the police and say, by the way, you know, you're right about this and we'll look at the sort of conditions that need to be satisfied. What's a PSPO? Public Spaces Protection Order. It's like a... And we'll cover, cover on to it, but it's like a generic sort of injunction um, that effectively prohibits behaviour in a particular place. But it's, it's, a, it's, it's a wider thing. You can identify a category of people without identifying the people. And that's something, we'll, again, we'll chat about this, because there's just done the um, case on Oxford Street uh, with Canada Goose mm -hmm. and Surgeon Peter. And that went wrong because they brought injunctions private injunctions that didn't I it went wrong by not effectively identifying the correct defendants and again that's something we can look at whereas PSPO it would that wouldn't have been an issue because it's it's at large it's basically anybody who falls within the, does these activities is caught whereas with an injunction you have to say you sir cannot do these activities uh, even buskers get uh, I mean in Stratford they need um, hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's what they, they pretty much started out as just general what's annoying people. It was dog walking and, and, and buskers and uh, charity muggers and people like that. And that's what it really started out as. And then it, some of people went, well, hang on a minute. And the, you know, the Enfield case was possibly the first political. Can I just double check, sorry, for the PSPO, is that just the local authority that can put that down? Can the police? The the is that they're initiated by the local authority, but they have to liaise with a particular, with the police. Uh, but it's pretty much down to the local authority. They just declare, effectively. Right. They are open to review. Interestingly, they can only be challenged by somebody with a connection to the local area. So if you're demoing from outside the area, then arguably you don't have standing to bring the challenge. So that's, yeah, because they're, they're, there to, they're there to sort of protect the, the local community. Although one thing they looked at in the Enfield case, I know we're getting slightly out of sync here, but... I'm happy to do it this way if, if, it, if it's you know, rather than it's too tight to nose. What they said there is the challenge from the protesters, they said, well, these are women who just come here basically from everywhere just for advice or a procedure. What connection do they have with the local area? And they said their connection with the local area is they're attending a clinic in the local area. <laughs> so they took a very, very broad, wide approach to who <coughs> fell within the protection. But whether or not somebody who sought to challenge that, the only people you can challenge a PSPO if you are effectively fined under it. If, 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 if somebody goes, you are arrested for breach of the PSPO, then you have standing to challenge. But to just challenge, it's a form of judicial review. It's not quite full judicial review. It's a procedure within, but effectively it's the same thing. You pop off to the court and say, I think this PSPO is too wide or shouldn't be allowed at all. And the first thing you have to prove is you have a connection with the local community. So. Again, and nobody seems to have tested that as to, you know, how wide a sort of thing that is. Okay. But, right, at the police station. So the police arrest you. They basically, um, like I say, Christopher will, ex uh, Bill will explain everything. Right, um, this is, again, <coughs> going to have to skip over. This is a very, very complex subject, uh, but I'll just skip over it as shortly as uh, I can. Um, when you turn up at the police station, first thing we do is they... Basically, they'll probably put you in a cell. They'll go through a few basic checks with you, name, address, ID. With a lot of public order offences, it's an offence in itself not to say who you are, and you can be arrested just for that, so they can take you back to the police station. Uh, how much you cooperate, well, that's not something we can give any guidance on. They ask you various questions about um, sort of your state of health, do you need any medication, any mental health issues. They also, unless there are certain offences within terrorism and stuff, you've got a right to have somebody informed. So you can say, I want you to tell X person. All this, I've got my one phone call. In the films, not in real life. <laughs> As it happens, 
They will. They, they, they're usually fairly cool, actually. They'll say, yeah, because they, they want to deal with you and get you in and out as quickly as possible. So uh, you'll meet a guy called the Custody Sergeant. I think he's the guy, actually. Although some have actually effectively farmed this out to the private sector, so they're not necessarily the police you're dealing with. But somebody called the Custody Sergeant has to do all the reviewing to check because his neck's on the line for, you know, make sure you're not going to sort of die in the cell or anything like that. You know, that you are... You know, you've got your medication with you, you know, there aren't any mental health issues, there's nobody who needs to be notified about you, nobody's going to worry. If you're uh, under 18, or they take the view, and the police can take the view themselves, that they believe you need assistance, they have to do something uh, called an appropriate adult. With kids, that's often a parent, but quite often it, they're the least appropriate people. Uh, social services might come down, but effectively, you can pretty much say, I would like X person to be my appropriate adult, if you've got like a carer or somebody. The police do have a veto on who the appropriate adult is, and quite often they will just, they, they just have a, a list of people who act as appropriate adults, okay? Appropriate adult is literally there, they're not there to do any legal advice, they're not your solicitor, they're literally just there to just make sure that all is well with you. And in fact, if they overstep the mark and start getting into the sort of legal issues and effectively uh, subsuming the solicitor role, that's one ground where the police will say, you're not an appropriate person to be on this, let the lawyer talk. You can ask for a duty solicitor from a rota, or you might um, have a solicitor you particularly would want notified. Um, anybody here familiar with the Green and Black people? Yeah, they, um, it's an organisation that effectively do legal advice for activists. Um, at some stage, we'll put on the page all the contacts are there. They quite they do know their stuff on this but their stance is very much they are very the police are the enemy which you know is understandable stance and their, their view is very shut up say nothing do nothing no cooperation which and that's very much a matter for you now one thing if you ever do all this sort of stuff where you say my solicitor told me to not say anything because when you go to court there are what are called adverse inferences from exercising your right to silence if you say my solicitor told me that's not a defence because they go, ultimately, it's down to you. And you've got to be very careful then because then if you get into a big row about it, your solicitor can end up giving evidence, which causes all sorts of problems because then you're waiving all sorts of legal privilege. Again, these are massively wide, complex areas. There's a lot of case law about. But generally speaking, you will get your solicitor there. You might have to sit around for hours and hours and hours. Uh, we'll come on to the, what we call the custody clock in a moment. So from the moment you are arrested, a clock starts running. And the police can keep you there for 24 hours. And then at the end of 24 hours, they either have to release you or charge you. However, if the 24 hours is coming to an end, they can actually go to the anybody above the rank of inspector and say, I need another 12 hours. And they always get it. I, cannot, I could not find a single case where anybody's been able to review successfully. I couldn't even find anybody brought a review of an internal police station extension of 36 hours. So that gives you an idea of, it, it's pretty much, you're, you're there for 36 hours. At the end of 36 hours, if they still need more time, they can go to the magistrate's court, and in the end they can go up to 72 hours. Um, there are certain offences that you can actually go to the magistrate's court on, but to be honest, they're called recordable offences, and just about everything that's not a traffic fine is recordable these days. So realistically, you're going to be... You could be there for, on the sort of public order things that you might get arrested on, you're looking at being there for 72 hours. At the end of 72 hours, like I say, they've got to make a decision either to charge you or release you. They can, in the interim, release you on what's called police bail, where they say, right, go away and come back on another day, either on this particular day or when we inform you. There's a bit of controversy and confusion over whether they can impose conditions on that, because Court bail can have conditions on. Police bail, they will sometimes say that, say, you're released on bail, you mustn't go into this area, or you mustn't do that. Arguably, you can just say, I'll do what I want, mate, because all you're doing is you're just saying, come back on another day and give me an appointment. You don't have any power to do that. And currently, that's it. nobody seems to be testing that. So, um, you know, that, that, just, just, go, just go away. You might not want to, because, you know, you know, obviously, they might be keeping an eye on you. Um, but then, yeah, you, you can go away and just come back on a further day. But... You're at the police station, your solicitor finally turns up. The police basically, they go and have a quick word with the police and say, right, what's my, what are you in for? And the police will do very limited disclosure. They don't have to reveal all the evidence they've got. They just have to say they've been nicked for Section 14 public order or a fray. 
um, we say that they were down at this particular site and they got into a fight or they kicked off or they graffitied the building. They don't have to say if they've got CCTV, they don't have to tell you what witnesses they've got, because they are allowed to sort of try and trip you up in the interview. So, but they have to at least let the solicitor know vaguely what you're there for. Then the solicitor goes and has a little chat with you. Be very, very, very careful. There are a lot of cases where they sort of go, because you're not at smoking police stations uh, anymore, but they say, do you want to roll up? Just go out in the yard, mate, that's fine. Just go and chat with solicitor out in the yard. And they were putting microphones in the yard. <laughs> and that was held to be perhaps not a breach of uh, REPA, uh, Regulation Investigative Powers Act, because did you have a legitimate expectation of privacy out in a police yard? In, a, in an interview room, in the police station with your solicitor, yes, clearly that's legal privilege, like, you know, that's legally privileged, but just outside having a smoke, chatting to your solicitor? Well, you know, again, they, they've, supposedly they've stopped doing that. So they stopped publicly doing that. They don't rely on the evidence they gather in any recordings anymore, but whether or not that's still going on, who knows? So just be very, very careful about, you know, how you communicate with your solicitor. But anyway, you chat to your solicitor and then you go in for the interview. Um, the interviews are recorded. They give you a standard caution, which you've probably all heard from TV. You have the right to remain silent, but it may harm your defence if you do not mention when questioned anything which you later rely on in court. The when questioned is quite important because you don't have to volunteer information. If you later in court say, well, actually, this is my explanation. Oh, you never mentioned that in the interview, but you never asked me. So that is something to, to bear in mind. Your solicitors are the best people to listen to about how to talk in, in, in the interview uh, because... Every case is individual, every case is different, and your attitude might be different. You might be really proud, you might want to go and say, yeah, I want to tell you everything that's happening. <laughs> because your statement, your interview, is going to be evidence in the court case. One thing to remember, and this is often a lot observed in the breach, and this is real criminal bar murdery, only interviews against interest are admissible in court. Only interviews against your own interest are admissible in court. Things that are purely exculpatory, where you say, I didn't do it, or this is, you know, you know, this is my explanation, technically that's not admissible. Now, if it's a mixed interview, half sort of, you know, sort of, well, yes, I stabbed him, but it was self-defence, that would go in, because the self-defence is exculpatory, so it shouldn't be admissible, but the I stabbed him is against your interest, so that does go in. Have you got time for a boring sort of bar anecdote? We do have plenty of time. Yeah, go on. Go on. Um, went up, uh, my, my client was uh, alleged to have sawn somebody's arm off uh, over a drug debt. The victim in the case decided, for discretion being the better part of valour, not to turn up. Uh, so the only evidence against him was my client's interview where he said, well, I turned round to, because this gets some money that this chap owed me, <laughs> you know, because he owed me some money and I'd helped him out in the past. And um, he ran at me. Luckily, I, there was a saw nearby. I brought a my carpet, I brought a saw. And I held up the saw. And he ran onto it and he cut his arm. And he backed off. But then he ran at me again. And he caught his arm again. And he did this several times and his arm fell off. <laughs> and like, so basically, the CPS went, you know what? We think the jury might find that a bit implausible. So we'll just go with the interview. The judge who was a nice civil lawyer sitting as a recorder, because this is a very scary thing, a lot of criminal judges, they have no criminal background whatsoever, got, gets, the, gets the bar book out and goes, interviews, purely exculpatory. <laughs> this is a purely exculpatory interview. I'm not allowing this. And the CPS are like, what? Uh, hang on, hang on. <laughs> no, no, I'm not allowing this. This is, just, it, it, this is just him saying some ridiculous excuse. This is, you know, this is not in, vaguely incriminating. But the CPS can't say, uh, we think it is. And basically, he excluded the interview. And they went, right, so, anyway, shall we get the jury in? They said, well, there's no point now, is there? Because that was literally their only evidence, and my guy got to walk on that. So, so there you go. But that's an interesting illustration of how it probably doesn't usually work in practice if a judge knows what they're on about. But that is something to remember. You might want to use your interview as a campaign, as a speech. Bear in mind the judge might not allow it. So you, you, you don't have an automatic right to have your interview um, heard in court. Um, so if you're saying something like, my defence is, and a common one people are trying to raise is the defence of necessity. I am doing this criminal act, it's not criminal because it's necessary to prevent a greater wrongdoing, which is you know environmental stuff or what's happening with the animals. Obviously the case law is pretty much going, 
it's not proximate enough. Necessity is things like, I drove over the limit because I was the only person who could get this person having a heart attack to hospital. Um, that, that's the sort of thing um, that necessity, you know, it has to be proximate and immediate. And the courts have been very reluctant to sort of even allow to go before the jury. This was necessary. I mean, it might well be your live exports thing, because it, that could be something we say, and this is literally, there is a, an animal cruelty offence occurring, and unless we do this now, that truck will go through. That might be something you could argue should go before a jury, because there's clearly a proximate mm. cause there, and but for you taking that action, mm. it's not like some abstract thing. You could say that truck mm. would have done gone to this abattoir, mm. or those animals would have been, and you know there's all the breaches of the regulation. I've done a few tachograph offences where, ironically, the tachograph offence, which is how many hours they were driving, proved uh, an animal exploitation offence. Mm -hmm. Because um, you could look at the tachograph records yeah. and sort of go, well, hang on a minute, where were you driving? And you had all these animals on board. Yeah. And it's like, right, okay. Um, I have to be very, you know, because I was acting for the guy with the tachograph offence, but it's like, you've got to be very careful here because this is an admission of an you know, a, a animal offence because you clearly had the live, you know, you've had them on board for too long and there's no water stops or anything like that. So, um, again, you know, this is something you can start looking into all these weird, obscure things. Sorry. Would the defendant in that case have to prove that an animal cruelty offence was occurring or just that they honestly believed that one was occurring? Good question. Um, it's a state of mind thing, but generally speaking, no, you have to, there has to be, for it to be necessary, the state of affairs has to exist. And this is something we'll look on when we look at something called attempts, where it's literally to the attempting the impossible. Mm. Is it factually there? But no, unfortunately, there's this mens rea element. Uh, mental, sorry. All crimes consist, most crimes consist of two elements, the mental element and the actual what you do. And the mental element is called mens rea, and the actual thing is called actus reus. Silly example. Uh, I, basically, you're walking underneath my warehouse and somehow a piano falls on your head and kills you. And if I pushed out the piano on your head with the intention of dropping the piano on your head to cause you serious harm or kill you, that's murder. If I was just arsing around and not messing around looking at health and safety and I recklessly knocked the piano and it fell on your head, that's probably manslaughter. Uh, if I did everything right and I wasn't being reckless but I just made some minor thing wrong, I've used the wrong strength of rope or something like that, it kills you. That might be a civil offence, or even a health and safety prosecution, but it's not murder or manslaughter. Same event, somebody's got a piano on the head and they're dead, but because of my state of mind, different offences. Okay? And that's something that crops up a lot in civil law. How long does it take to explain mens rea at law school? That's <laughs> Reyes workshop one, it's half of workshop one. Well, there you go. <laughs> it's, 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 it could, yeah, it, it can be a hard thing to grasp. Um, especially when you get into what we call intent, because the legal version of intent has nothing to do with the everyday version of intent, which is, you know, I wanted to do this. You can intend to do something even if it's the last thing you wanted to do. It all gets highly complicated. But anyway, so we're in the interview. <laughs> so, um, the interview is taped. Like I said, you can go no comment. You can refuse to answer. You can do a prepared statement. We can go, that's all I'm going to say about it. Uh, the solicitor's written it out for me. I'm just going to hand that over. I'm going to go no comment. The worst thing you can possibly do, and I know I uh, wouldn't give any specific advice, is to do a mixed interview. No comment. I'll answer that, I'll answer that, I'll answer that, no comment. Because it's always like, were, were you there? I, I was there at the demo. I was in that space. I was with that bunch of people. Did you punch the policeman? No comment. And that goes before <laughs> a jury. Um, I mean, those of us old enough to remember the O.J. Simpson trial, with the, you know, don't, you know, was this a conspiracy to frame this man? No comment. You know, I'd like to plead the fifth on that. It doesn't go down very well. Um, so yeah, at the end of the interview, uh, basically, um, it's all recorded. There are two copies of the tape. One is sealed up and kept safe for somewhere. The other one is used to produce copies, which eventually you will get a copy of if it goes to court. Okay, you're not entitled to take one away with you there and then. At the end of the interview, um, basically, again, they'll usually make a decision to charge or release or to release on police bail. Um, but again, that's something, speak to your solicitor about <coughs> the interview. Um, we've covered the custody clock. Samples, most offences, other than very, very minor traffic ones, automatic um, and non-consensual taking of what's called infant samples, DNA, and they usually do it by a mouth swab. Um, so they'll take your DNA, and those are run against a speculative check against uh, a database to see if they flag up on any other offences. 
what happens with those samples, I can go into more detail. I think what I'll probably do is after this talk is I'll put some of the tables of things up on, 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 the, on my website somewhere and we put some links on the Facebook because what happens with those samples depends on the nature of the offence you're charged with and the ultimate disposal. Generally speaking, if you're prosecuted for any event and convicted, they're going to stay forever. Okay, They are there forever. If you are prosecuted and not convicted, how long they can keep them for depends, but you're looking at being out there for at least five years. If you are not proceeded with, and they just go, we're not going to charge you, then theoretically they're supposed to be destroyed pretty much straight away. However, there are provisions to keep them for a little while, certainly for the length of running the against the databases, and possibly for a little bit longer. And there's, a, there's something called the biometrics commissioner, and they can actually go and say, there's something not quite right. We've got, we've got reasons to sort of say we should be keeping these people's DNA for a bit longer. And it could be because they, they're expecting something to happen. Say, for instance, you go, we think these people are going to do something down the line. And it would be really, really handy to make sure we still got their DNA for, you know, to check against potential future crimes, which is all getting a bit sort of minority report. <laughs> but that is the sort of thing that you need to be concerned about. Um, and we've covered police bail. So, whizzing through. I've done the appropriate adults. Youth court, like I say, youths are uh, treated differently, and that's anybody under the age of 18. Now, rather, rather bizarrely, it starts off with where you're sent to the court, depending on your age at the age of charge, but how you are dealt with by sentence is what your age is on what's called arraignment, which is where you're asked to enter a plea. So there's two slightly different things there, and how they reconcile them, we'll get some expert criminal practitioner like Heather Hope or Natasha McDermott to come and explain all that, but... It, it, it probably doesn't actually crop up a lot uh, of things, but if you're under the age of 18, you should be dealt with by the youth court, which is a specialist type of magistrate's court. There are, however, exceptions to that. If a youth is engaged in an offence with adults, they can be sent to the Crown Court with the adults if it's a more convenient way of dealing with it. If an offence is so serious that um, a sentence of less than two years would not be appropriate if, if on conviction, that might get kicked up to the Crown Court as well. Okay, so, but generally speaking, youth court is probably beyond the scope of, sort of this lecture. We'll just say it's a specialised type of magistrate's court, and they have some different sentencing or alternatives to sentencing available to them. Uh, they have a lot of restorative justice things. I think for like referral orders, which is you know like write a letter of apology, go clean that graffiti up, etc., etc. Um, we'll look at your disposal options. Disposal is just the fancy way of saying. It's not quite the same as sentencing, because not all disposals are sentences. Some are deliberately designed to divert you from the criminal justice system. But let's assume, uh, basically, you go to court. Your first appearance is also at the magistrate's court, regardless of the offence. It's going to be sort of like serial killing. You, everything starts at the magistrate's court. It's a lot simpler now, though, in that if it's a serious offence, it is sent, and that's the word they use, sent to the Crown Court. We used to have all these things. We did not have grand juries since the 60s, but then we had various forms of committal proceedings and things, which were like little mini trials to see if there was enough evidence to send it off. Now they go, it's a serious offence, it can't be tried in the magistrate's court, it's off to the Crown Court. But you appear at the magistrate's court. If you've been held and the police haven't bailed you, uh, they don't, you know, so they charge you, what they can do is they go, we're now charging you with this offence, we'll release you on police bail, to attend the magistrate's court on this day. If they say we're not going to bail you, we're going to, we're going to just put you to the magistrate's court, you've got to go there the next working day. Now working days for magistrate's courts include Saturdays and bank holidays. So unless it's Sunday, you will be produced the next morning, depending on the timing. If you've got leaked sort of in the wee hours of Saturday morning, you might end up uh, still doing Mondays. But in my, because of my massive imposter syndrome, uh, when I was in these chambers, I spent seven years doing every single Saturday in the magistrate's court. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, and it was fantastic. We used to do B Bow Street a lot, and that was great because that's almost like a Victorian thing. We used to sit there and try and guess what people had done when they came home. <laughs> lot, lot, lot of like, yeah, minor public card, uh, drunken disorder, kids. You know, it was, <laughs> it was, we were borderline chronology. It was, uh, <laughs> but yeah, so you're produced at the magistrate's court. Um, if you're an overnighter, and uh, you're in custody, they deal with you first, it's all very polite, assuming they can get the paperwork together. And the paperwork is what we call, now, any criminal practitioners here? Is it advanced information or advanced information? 
Exactly. Nobody seems to know. <laughs> because is it, it's information you get in advance. But is it, if this is the advance information, or is this the information we have advanced to you? And it seems to say different things at different times. So anyway, if anybody can ever... And also, if anybody can tell me what the difference between a remand and an adjournment is, that would be lovely as well. Uh, on, put you on the spot. I should know this. I you know, should. I think we learn it next week. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 1997, seven Coleman, I still don't know. The, you can have an adjournment without a, a remand currently, but you can't have... All an remands are adjournments, but not yeah. adjournments are remands. But why? Yeah, I can tell you why. <laughs> no, I don't think anybody can. Uh, seriously, we've been asking that question in like you know, the, the, including in the Bailey, and nobody knows at all. Because you wouldn't be remanded with a postal requisition, would you? If you get a postal requisition, <laughs> you're not because remanded. There's an element of liberty. To, it just means that it's got yes, to be but you could still be done with the bail act for not attending a summons. So it's like so what? It's yeah, exactly. Yeah, anyway, so there you go. <laughs> Constitution reform. Somebody explain that, please. The advance information is just the bare bones. It's a case summary of what you've been arrested for. Possibly some statements. Possibly what we call a roti, uh, record of taped interview. And that can be, if they've had time, they'll, uh, it'll very rarely be the full verbatim thing. It might literally just be... I mean, the best one we ever had was one that said, um, suspect becomes sh shifty and evasive. And that was literally the record of the, the summary of the taped interview. <laughs> and it's like, uh, I go, it's just so you know what's on the tape, it, that's not necessarily the thing that will go in front of the court. But it's just basically because your solicitor might not be the same solicitor that you had at the police station, but almost certainly won't be. And it'll probably be some barrister down there, and I don't know if it's still 35 quid. I think it still is because legal aid rates haven't gone up in 20 years. But it's some barrister who's getting 35 quid to turn up and get you to sign the legal aid form for the tickets, basically. And they will go, there you go, there's the advance information, and you'll go in the cells, and it's great now because you don't have to give them tobacco, so you're not actually running at a loss anymore. Because you're <laughs> tobacco over. And you'll go, hello, Mr. Is that you? And I, 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 three times I have represented the wrong person in my career because <laughs> just not being able to read the handwriting. I'm going down and going, so and so here, and it's like some of the similar sounding name. And I actually got somebody, uh, I've got to drop the charges, and then I was going home going, I'm the best lawyer in the world. And the solicitor rang and said, Where the f are you? Our guy's still signing the cell. <laughs> 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 like, ah, right, and it turned out there were two people there with the same name. And it's really, and it's, it, it, like, it was a really obscure name. It's not my fault. It's two Polish guys. It's not your fault. <laughs> it's not my fault. It's probably also arresting two Polish guys on the same night. Anyway, so yeah, so you get this bit of paper, uh, and literally you will go there. You've got a few options. Now, what might happen, and again, we want to make this relevant for public order stuff. You might well say, let's just deal with it now. You've been nicked for section 14. That's not complying with a condition on a public order event. So police have said, move off that area. No, move up right, you're nicked, sunshine. You turn up there. It's not the biggest offence in the world. There's 30 of you in the cells. The magistrates are bored. They want to go home. They're going to, do, they're going to weigh everybody off with a conditional discharge. So it might well be that you just go, let's just go in there now. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, put the, please put it to Yeah, what's to plead guilty? Okay. And then you just do the mitigation, and it's all done and dusted there and then. Um, so that is one option. If there's enough information there, and to be perfectly frank, you can sort of quite often go, look, let's just get it done and dusted now. We, we know we don't have all the paperwork here, but we've got enough to charge. Now, there's a tactical advantage for that because of all the how double jeopardy works. You might want to go in and go, actually, let's just plead to breach of condition before they get all the stuff out. You realise that the breach of condition was stabbing that policeman. Um, and then, like, you know, well, I got my conditional discharge, and that's, that's dealing with this offence, and it would be double jeopardy because to try and charge me for something else because it's arising out of the same facts. I mean, that's an extreme example, but sometimes you might, if, if there's a decent deal on offer, you might want to just take it uh, and things. So you can basically plead on the first occasion, you'll do your mitigation, which is, uh, you know, this is. And the, the mitigation is going to be, this is why I'm doing it. The courts have been very nice about accepting that everybody is genuinely motivated and stuff. They've gone, we appreciate what you're saying. You're all nice people. It's a bit of a sort of white middle class movement at the moment, you know, which is just like maybe the demographics of it. But it, I know it sounds awful. It's all people going, you've got a good career, he's going to university, he's doing this. It's the sort of people that get weighed off the conditional discharges. Um, so that's quite often something that happens. I mean, Can I just ask you, what is a conditional discharge? Well, we'll be coming on to that, sir. I'm glad oh. you asked me that, because we will come on to that. Um, 
Lord of Trial is just, I say, some offences can be dealt with in the Magistrates Court, some offences can only be dealt with in the Crown Court, some are what are called trial either way. And generally speaking, if it's trial either way offence, both the prosecution and the defence have to agree that it should be heard in the Magistrates Court, and then the Magistrates have to agree. Usually the prosecution will say, blah, 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 this is low value. I mean, criminal damage is a bad example, actually, because the, it depends on the value of the criminal damage where it should be charged. But let's say it's um, ABH, that should be tried either way. Blah, 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 there was a bit of a punch-up, but we say it's not the most serious thing. Your sentencing powers on conviction would be enough. We say you could deal with it here. Because the Magistrates Court currently, I think, most of the criminal court, six months for one offence, 12 months in total. That's the limit of their sentencing power. They were about turning up to two years. I don't think that's happened yet. Um, they were thinking about it, I think, particularly as they're thinking of dropping six months sentences anyway, mm. which means the Magistrates almost couldn't impose mm. much at all in this. They have been talking about that since I was... But I, I mean, don't think it's been. Yeah, no. they've been literally talking about it for like at least 15 years, and I'm not sure. Yeah, so they haven't done that yet. So basically, if they say six months for one offence or 12 months in total isn't going to be enough, they'll say, no, we think this should go to the Crown Court. One thing that magistrates can do is have a trial in the magistrates' court, and then at the end of it, go, wow, <laughs> that was a lot more serious than we thought. We're going to send it to the Crown Court for sentence. Generally speaking, they shouldn't do that because they should have all the information as to, they assume, let's say this person was convicted now, we know what the offence is meant to be, we know what their criminal record is, we sh you know, they should be able to make a decision there and then, so theoretically, sending for sentence, committal for sentence, shouldn't happen a lot, but it, it, it still does. So they will say, right, we find, yes, as magistrates, we find that uh, we, we, we would accept jurisdiction. And then they'll say to the defendant, what do you want to do? And you might say, okay, I'm happy, I'll have the trial here. Um, or you might say, no, no, I want my 12, you know, 12 good men through. I've seen, I've seen the film. Um, <laughs> although there is, there used to be a great piece of graffiti in the cells at the Old Bailey that literally said as you walked in, said, I'm about to be tried by 12 people too stupid to get out of jury service. In my experience, juries tend to get it right, so, um, which I, might not be a good thing. <laughs> I won't say, if I was ever up for anything, if I was innocent, I'd want to be court-martialed. If I was guilty, I'd want to be tried by jury at Snaresbrook. Yeah. Um, so if anyone on the offence. I, I was going to trouble at Snaresbrook on a... My guy was up for... He was a black cab driver, and he was up for uh, tax evasion. And I said to the jury, Members of the jury, now let's not be hypocrites. And the judge went, uh, can we have a word? <laughs> <laughs> they, they, it, 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 it was literally in four minutes. <laughs> said, Why did you even bother trying? You know, you were trying to try something in Snaresbrook on tax evasion. Uh, yeah. But anyway, so there you go. So, yeah, so you have your mode of trial, and again, like I say, um, if it's sort of you retain jurisdiction, you will be, um, there'll be an adjournment for a trial, what called summary trial, to take place in the magistrate's court, and I'll be in front of three effectively lay people or one professional uh, judge. In London, there's a lot of what are called district judges who are professional magistrates uh, and things, and it's in the new place of Westminster, because the old Horsley Road was shut down, very sad, but there's the nice posh core of Westminster. And what we've noticed is that there's a particular tranche of district judges that they're using for all these. And so far, they seem to be... We haven't had the more serious things during the last Extinction Rebellion yet, but so far, with all the minor public order, they seem to be taking a pretty much a sort of semi-liberal view. Um, if the trial is adjourned, whether to the Crown Court or the Magistrates Court, do you get released there and then? It depends. If they say, like, yep, that's fine, we don't have any worries about you turning up or committing further offences, they'll just bail you, possibly on conditions. But they might try to remand you in custody. There is a presumption that you're entitled to bail. To not grant bail, the prosecution must show there is a substantial risk of either failure to attend, commit further offences, interfere with witnesses, or otherwise pervert the course of justice. Okay? And there's also a for your own safety element, although there's a bit of an argument as to whether that can be a bail condition. But if it's a very notorious crime, you know, something where the, you know, people are banging on the side of vans, they sort of say, we're going to keep you inside for your own safety, mate. But um, those, can, th 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 those are the three things that you want to have to show one of those three things, or any combination. And then what you've got to show is that actually these are reasons why you don't have to worry about that. Um, again, this is something that very much works against people on the basis of demographic thing, um, failure to attend, tied to the local community, uh, is 
he's got a title in the local community, he's got a fixed permanent address, he's got a job or college he goes to every day, of course he's going to attend because you know where he's going to be. Kind of thing. But what if it's some sort of transient person, no fixed abode, bit of sofa surfing, you know, sort of like that sort of slightly invisible homeless thing, can be a problem uh, and things. But you can sort of say about conditions, the usual conditions are residence, he will live at this address, might surrender travel documents. Um, one that it annoys the police more than it annoys anybody else is, is to sign on at a police station. He will, once a week or three times a week or every day, he'll go down to the police station and go, here I am governor, I'm still in the country, or I'm not absconding. That just annoys the police. And I used to actually say that, say we could do signing on, but and you see the police go, because they don't want to look at people just turning up at the counter every day. Uh, the classic one is sureties. Uh, surety is where somebody says, you get some great good person to say, if this person does not attend, I will forfeit a sum of money. Now, they don't have to hand the money over at the time. Handing the money over at the time is what we call security. And that very rarely gets done. But you can say, here's £50,000. If I don't turn up, you can keep that. But very, very rare, because basically it was seen as, here's £50,000 for me, not to try for me not to send in court. So, you know, what's, you know how, what, what's the cheapest you'll accept for me not to come? Um, but... It's actually it's, a, it's an offence to indemnify a surety, by the way. So you can't say to your mate, look, you say, stand bail for me and I'll sort you out if I uh, don't bother turning up. Uh, remember the Assange thing, where all his mates said, yeah, yeah, we'll stand. And basically, if somebody doesn't turn up, then it's automatic that you surrender the surety. It doesn't matter. You can literally say, I was holding him down, say, trying to drag him to court myself. It doesn't matter. Because the whole point is, it's the pressure... It's the moral pressure, not the physical control. So, and again, it's not necessarily the sum of money, it's the impact on the surety. So 50 quid off your sainted old mother, who's just on a pension, is worth a lot more than 100,000 off your very rich, sort of like, you know, multi-millionaire sponsor. Um, but those are sort of the conditions you can offer. Um, these days, you only get one go at getting bail as well, in the old days, you'd, you'd keep coming back and go, oh, I've just thought of something else we could do. There's doorstop statue as well. Yes. Whereas like people basically turn up and just check you check you're still there. Um, also, there was all the, are they still doing the circle thing with the tagging? Yeah, you can have a tag, but that's also quite a good one because if you have a tag and you're tagged for I think it's over eight or nine hours a day, mm. then any sentence that you were to end up getting it, that that day that nine hours counts as half a day. Mm. Um, so for people who are fairly sure that they're likely to get a sentence. But I like could have a long bail condition. They can end up serving a significant part of their sentence at home in the evenings, so it works out much better. And also, if you're very nice to Circle, they were setting the tags where they were putting the squelch control, so people could literally get to the off license uh, and stuff because, they, because there's a certain sensitivity. And all, it's amazing how many people had iron baths, and it's like, oh, that's why you can get in touch with me for those three hours. I was, I was in the bath, and, uh, and remember the one where they were in Liverpool where the kids were putting on the dogs. <laughs> they worked out that there was a that if you basically in a really really hot bath you could stretch them enough to get them off and then they were fastening them to their dog's collars so the, the tag was looking like they were still in the local area <laughs> yeah he's still there Yeah, he, he, he spends a lot of time in that yard <laughs> yeah, so, so they, they, there's a little wire strips in there so you can't just not do that anymore so, uh, there we go. right various penalties um, now the one I haven't looked at actually is uh, a caution a caution is a very, very common disposal. Uh, now, a caution is basically, it's like a sort of formal final warning. There are regular cautions and what we call conditional cautions. Again, a hugely complex topic. Uh, basically, it's something that only the police can do. The, 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 the CPS themselves can't do it, and the lawyer in court can't do it, but there's also policemen around to do a caution. Sometimes they'll offer you one at the police station and say, we, we are happy to deal with this by way of a caution. Sometimes you'll go to court and go, oh, come on, can we have a caution? And we used to do those, like, can we have cautions? Can we caution them? Because we'll, so we'll find a policeman, excuse me, <laughs> officer, officer, <laughs> can, you, can you have a chat with the CPS rep and caution all these people? A caution is basically where they say, um, they, they need to prove a few things, first of all. It has to be an offence. There has to be uh, enough evidence that there'd be a realistic prospect of uh, conviction. It has to be accepted. You have to, you, when you accept a caution, you're admitting you've done the offence. It's an admission of guilt. The thing with the caution, though, is technically it's not a conviction. 
okay? But they are recorded, and we'll look at that when we look at sort of criminal records and effects and things. So they, there is a note of precaution. And there's, generally speaking, you can only have one caution every two years, subject to a few exceptions. And there are some offences that they shouldn't caution on without seeking high-end approval from CEC. You're not, not going to get a caution on a murder, for instance. Mm. Although, theoretically, there is a procedure to go and sort of, you know, appeal to the sort of uh, DPP or the senior prosecutor and say, I know it's a bit unusual, but we'd like to go for caution. Um, there's also a called conditional cautions, which is, we're going to caution you, but here's a list of conditions that if you breach any of these conditions, that will re revoke the caution on its own. And they're not necessarily offensive. They could be things like stay out of a particular area or things like that. But generally speaking, if you're cautioned, um, and things, that's pretty much the end of it. Um, it's like, there's your final warning, don't do it again. But like I say, they do go on, on your, I'd say criminal record, and we'll come on to that. There's no sort of, sort of definition of criminal record. It's a, it's a very nebulous term. Um, there's also youth cautions uh, and things. There used to be like written warnings and final warnings. They've all gone out the window now, so pretty much the only, which makes life simpler, the only thing available is a caution. Uh, and again, the good thing about cautions is they're spent as soon as they're given, unless it's a conditional caution, in which case they're spent at the end of the condition period, and that's usually three, three to six months. And, and it can be something like, don't get drunk in a public place, or keep going to your drug rehab thing. I mean, it's probably not the sort of thing that would apply, but it could be something like, don't go on any demos, or stay away from that protest, or something like that. Fixed penalty notices. Um, this, the, the, these... They're not getting used so much on demos, although I've heard rumours that they might, just because of the sheer scale of resourcing, that they might start to try and use them. Uh, and there's also something called penalty notice for disorder, which is a specific species of fixed penalty notice. They were actually to start introduced to just start, like, control like, drunken behaviour. They use them a lot in Newquay, down from Cornwall. They hand them out in Newquay all the time, because they can't be bothered arresting anybody, so it's like, there's your fixed penalty notice. Um, there's two levels of them, and I think currently they're £90 and £180, depending on how serious the offence is, and, and th those change. But literally, it's, it's the public order equivalent of a parking ticket. Um, they don't amount to an admission of guilt. That's the one good thing about a fixed penalty notice. They are not an admission of guilt whatsoever. It's basically, I'm not going to contest it, I'll take it, I'll pay the £80, you've got 21 days to pay it, if you don't pay it within the 21 days, it goes up another 50%. It's like, it, it, it is a parking ticket. It really is a parking ticket. It's the same model, it's the same software. It's, it's the same, it's Capita, it's Capita actually run them, so it's the same, same company. But again, they are something that could be quite useful. You don't have to accept a fixed penalty notice, but then you can be arrested. But the general rule is, it's a bit like the caution for fixed penalty notices, you should not escalate the level of how you deal with an offence just because somebody won't take what you think is the appropriate thing. So if you think something is appropriate for a caution, or you think something is appropriate for a fixed penalty notice, the mere fact that people don't know should not move it, kick it up to the next level. Where you go, right, I'm going to arrest you then, or I'm going to charge you, or I'm going to prosecute you. Uh, you know, I'm going to refer you to prosecution. Theoretically, that shouldn't happen. In practice, if you say, I'm not taking a fixed penalty notice, what's going to happen? They're going to nick you for drunken disorder and they're going to spend the night in your cell. So, or some sort of public order offence. Bindovers. I like bindovers. Uh, one of the oldest forms of criminal disposal date back to at least 1361 and were probably like in use 100 years before then. A bindover is effectively a bet with the court that you'll stay out of trouble. It really is. You are bound to you're bound over to keep good behaviour and you're bound over in a sum of money. And literally what they will say is, right, here's the deal. We'll write your name in a book if for the period of the bind-over, and again it's usually three months, six months or twelve months is a very common thing for a bind-over. Um, you go, as long as we don't hear from you again, that's the end of the matter. If, however, you breach the peace or you do something, you have to give that money. You have to give us that money. Uh, and again, they're massively complicated bind-overs. It's also the, how they're dealt with in the magistrate's court, it's different how they're dealt with the crown court. What effect, whether you can accept one or refuse one is a hugely complicated issue. What the effects of breaching them are, because there's statutory bindovers, there's common law bindovers, there's things from middle, like you know, Middle Ages law. I mean, seriously, we could spend all day talking about bindovers. It's quite fascinating. But they can be a very good, quick disposal, because again, there's a bit of an argument as to whether the amount of admission of, the, of an offence, and also whether if you've had a bindover, you can be. Um, get a good character correction if you're ever prosecuted in the future. 
Uh, and again, it's really complicated. Is this something you'd have to report to your regulatory body? Well. So if it were, like, if it was a fixed penalty notice, you wouldn't have to. No, because that's just like a parking ticket. Yeah. It depends on your body, and that's something we'll briefly come on to with the employment law thing, about what did your owners to report non-convictions mm. and things. But yeah, I mean, like I said, the status of the bind over, you'd think after sort of like, you know, 800 years, you'd suss it, but it, it's all a bit <laughs> nebulous. Uh, but yeah, this is the, 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 the uh, basically, the guidance to the Crown Prosecution Service literally says about good character directions, refer to supervisor or senior manager, and, uh, and, uh, who will kick it off probably to some sort as to whether or not in that particular situation you can refer to it in court as to whether it's previous conviction or not, or whether you're a good character or not. Um, but again, it's just one of the many forms of disposal. The big one that's getting used a lot in all the sort of animal rebe uh, extinction rebellion thing, the conditional discharge. Um, there are two types of discharges. There's actually something called an absolute discharge. An absolute discharge is you appear before the court, they hear all the evidence, you plead guilty or you're convicted, and they say we're giving you an absolute discharge. An absolute discharge should only be used where they think you should never have been prosecuted in the first place. They're very, very rare because generally if the magistrates hint that they don't think you should be prosecuted, the Crown will take the hint and not offer any evidence. But a conditional discharge is, as the name suggests, you are discharged subject to you abiding by the conditions and you will be discharged, the conditional discharge will run for a period of time, six to twelve months is very very common and the general rule is if you keep your nose clean and you don't commit any other offences in the period of the conditional discharge that's the end of the matter, you are literally discharged, you have been charged with an offence, you were it, it, retrospectively they press the re retcon button, you were never charged, you are discharged, it's all gone away, not a conviction. Again, though, as to what the effect of that not conviction is, and like DBS type stuff will come on to. Again, very, very nebulous. Um, if you do breach conditional discharge, when you're brought back before the court, you are dealt with for the new offence, and retrospectively, you are sentenced for the original offence. So, but it's a very common way of dealing with things. Um, the six to twelve month thing is interesting, that because let's say something happens. Um, like on the Animal Rights March, and you get nicked on up August the 17th. You're produced in court on August the, let's say, it's a Saturday, so you're going to be produced on the 19th, a few days later, you get your 12-month conditional discharge. What happens next year when you're on the march? Do you risk it? So that's the thing, because you've got two days left on your conditional discharge. Yeah. So that's why the 12 month They don't seem to be doing this tactic yet, but you, it'd be interesting to see if they start conditionally discharging people for periods that cover future events. And that it might even be twelve months and a week. Twelve, yeah. Or, or we or we nick somebody on the first day of like the, the, the two weeks starting next week. We nick somebody. We're well, conditionally discharged for a month. Because <laughs> then what? Yeah. Because you know mm -hmm. what would happen. I mean, chances are we'll do six months anyway. But yeah, that's conditional discharging. Fines. Um, obviously, it's just pay some money uh, and things. If you don't pay your fine, or you can't pay, if you can't pay your fine, they are fairly good. And something like I think it's something like thirty percent of fines are actually recovered, aren't they, or something? Just because people, the sort of people get engaged with the criminal justice system, they're not exactly got a lot of disposable income. Um, so fines are very rare to recover. If you don't pay a fine, or you you refuse, there's usually a period in default in custody um, and things. And what we used to do a lot was we deal with a lot of offences that will say minor public order. Go, it's a fifty quid fine or one day. And he'll be in the cells overnight. So I tell you what, let's count the overnight in the cells as the sentence in lieu of a fine. And that was a really, really common way. There's also an actual old magistrate's court sentence, which is you've got to hang around the court all day. <laughs> Seriously, it was you are sentenced to sit at the back of this courtroom and be as bored as we are. <laughs> <laughs> and I've had that on a few occasions, and literally people going, oh God, I'd rather pay the money. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm just, How do you do this? And it's like, I know, I know. So no one's been seen as the jury. <laughs> <laughs> it's not quite the same as jury duty. Hey, come on, they get 38 quid a day and a sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever it is these days. And, and the fines are proportional to what? Yeah, Just fines are proportional to the offence. There are five levels of fine. So you look at the table for the offence, it will say, sometimes it'll be in the statute, or it'll say a fine of level three, and I think that's a thousand pounds now, level three fine. No, it's, it's normally banned A, B, C, D, E, F, and that's then that's either. defined by, or at least for most magistrates, was by people's income. Mm -hmm. So it'll be, uh, you know, band A is 200% of your weekly income, band B is 100 to 150, I can't remember. 
Oh, right, so it's based on... Yeah, because mm-hmm. there's two elements. Because uh, that, that guy got the speeding fine, wasn't he? It didn't turn out to be like five million pounds or something because he was a multi-millionaire. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was the largest ever speeding fine. But because he had like effectively unlimited income, it was like, well, 50% of your annual income, 10% of your annual income appears to be... And it was like literally millions. And they shouldn't be that high. They were well, the thing was spread... Now, the good thing is all the sentencing guidelines are available now. And you can actually look on, and it's fantastic how it works. There's what they call the, the sort of statutory mitigation and uh, aggravation for various offences, and there's personal mitigation for an aggravation of offences. And you can look and literally, so this is an offence, and it was those circumstances, so that's column B, and if I move along, and this old, and this is the, and these are the aggravating factors kicking in, these are the mitigating. I mean, as one judge said to me, he goes, this is fucking, it's sentencing by fucking statute. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> but, to an extent they're right, and it's all about consistency and things. If it's one thing is when you're given the, the one form they also give you at the court is mean form. Include, and people never fill it out. If you don't fill it out, they basically be wacky with the top fine. It's your duty to say, I can't afford to pay this. So if you go, I'm not filling any forms out, they'll go, okay, fair enough, we'll just assume that you've got infinite income and we'll just whack you with the top fine. Um, but yeah, so but basically also you've got to remember there are things called there are comp- there are compensation orders which they can do if you cause criminal damage or something you will pay for that window and there's also this victim surcharge thing uh, is that usually 15 I'm quid on the guilty plea and surcharge it's, it's really not very much it's, yeah but basically as well as that you pay like a victim surcharge which is supposed to go to helping restorative justice and stuff but appears so to go to the building fund um moving up the ladder community penalties and probation um Again, that's you know the old community service. You see, you see people, you know, sleeping the streets and things like that. There's all sorts of other disposals in terms of drug referral orders, things like that. Nothing, those sorts of things probably aren't relevant to what we're looking at uh, and stuff. But yes, I mean, basically, all those things come under what we just call community penalties. Okay, uh, and the general rule is that ten hours of community service is meant to be equivalent to one month in prison. So you know. 120 hours of community service is meant to be a total sentence. Then you can decide whether that's true or not. <laughs> uh, custody, uh, basically, that's going to prison. Or if it's um, young people, young people have slightly different things, like detention and training orders, what used to be called forceful training um, and things. But custody is basically imprisonment. And again, just to let you know, there's a slight difference between committal to prison for contempt of court and imprisonment in terms of. The end result is you're sat in like one of the local prisons, but as to whether it's a conviction and what happens afterwards and when you can be released is all different. Again, beyond the scope of this, but basically it's being sent to prison. So you get you, you get sent to prison if it's a serious enough offence. You serve effectively half your prison sentence on in prison. You serve the next half of it on licence. If you breach any licence conditions, you're subject to immediate recall. Sometimes you get. Um, you can get extended license periods, you can have, you can have life licenses and things. So the time you spend in prison isn't necessarily related to the sentence. You know, you will go to prison, you'll, I will sentence you to two years in prison. You'll serve a year, you'll do a year on license, but there can be things where we'll go, and you will do an extended license period, because we're, especially for, we don't have this, we used to have this concept of dangerousness, and it was a nightmare, these imprisonment for public protection, and nobody could figure out what any of them meant, seriously. That's all gone away now, but there still are provisions for extending license periods and things like that. Again, if you, to be honest, if you're in that situation where that's an issue, you're going to have your own lawyer, and they can tell you. But just to warn you, that's the thing. Suspended sentences. Um, I find this offence is so serious that only a custodial sentence is appropriate. However, I'm going to suspend it for up to three years uh, for a period. If you, again, keep your nose clean during that, it, you don't go to prison. Breach um, the suspension for committing another offence, or certainly sometimes put, put conditions on it. The sentence must be activated in full unless it would be manifestly unjust to do so. So basically, it's pretty much automatic. If you get a suspended sentence and you go out and commit another offence, that sentence will be deactivated. And it all gets very complicated as to whether sentences are consecutive or concurrent. And again, that's really beyond the scope of this. Something called deferred sentences. Uh, basically, I'm not going to sentence you now. Come back here in six months' time. Let's see how you've got on with life, and it can and, and it can be things where you, you know just get your act together, get off drugs, get a job. I mean, seriously, those are the conditions they can put on. I had one guy wait, 
He got a deferred sentence. He said, "Come back here on Christmas Eve, and let's just see. Let's just see where you're going to spend Christmas." Mm. And it really, and it was brilliant. It was, it was a guy. He was being a regular client, young lad. And he did the classic thing. He got a steady girlfriend, and suddenly went completely, you know, not not the sort of girls that like, you know, there was a lot of sort of like she's showing off, and then people grew out of it. And he, he, he basically he had a girlfriend. She got pregnant, and he just he just changed. And it was so nice. His kids were. We don't really have the Maverick fridges anymore, but we just went in. It went. Just come in, come in. It's almost like the balloons. He goes. It's so rare that I get to do this. That I can read the report. Well done. Now you're a lot happier now. And they were like best buds. <laughs> but they'd seen each other so many times over the years. So it's almost one of those. Oh, it's so clean. But yeah. So um, that's deferred sentences. There are also sorts of obscure medieval things in the background about how you can defer a sentence and things that they, they never seem to get used in practice. Rehabilitation Offenders Act. The idea is, you've probably heard of that, and it's the idea that we have things called spent convictions, where after a certain period of time, a conviction is spent. It's like it never happened, you don't have to refer to it, except with about a million exceptions when you do. Okay, But generally speaking, uh, you don't have to declare it for jobs, you don't have to declare it on bank loans, you don't have to, you know, that sort of thing, you don't have to declare it for like visas and things, although again, we'll come on to all the exceptions to that. How long the rehabilitation period is depends on your age at the time of the conviction and the nature of the offence. Cautions, like I say, cautions are spent as soon as they're given. Sentences of four years or above are never spent. Sentences between 30 months and four years are spent after six years. Sentences less than that is three years. And it's half, the suspension period is half of that if you're under 18. Okay? There are certain exceptions. Um, some like when you're applying for visas, it's up to foreign countries whether they want to know about spent convictions. There are certain jobs that you know you, you have to declare, sort of like any, uh, anything in the security services or police and things. Convictions are always have to be declared. There are some offences that there are some. It's rather strange that there are, even when you're asked to declare a spent conviction, there's different categories of what you. There's there some things that are called like protected disclosures, where even where it's a Yes, you have a duty, you know, like some jobs, you must declare spent convictions. There are still some that you don't have to. Uh, it's, it's all very, very weird. There's a big table of what, which ones you have to do. Far beyond the scope of this. Again, I'll put a link up to it. Um, most of the public order stuff you're going to be dealt with. Um, they're the sort of things that are going to be spent pretty much, because fines and things like that are spent within like six months and 12 months, depending on like the level of fine. Non-custodial non disposals pretty much spend very, very quickly. Okay, so... Really, unless you're going into prison, Rehabilitation Offenders Act isn't something you need to know too much about. Disclosure and Barring Service, what we used to call the old Criminal Records Bureau, they're the people that if you're going for certain jobs, your employers will go to them for a certificate as to what your sort of previous dealings with the law is. And there are different levels. There's the basic DBS check, enhanced DBS check. In Scotland, we have a simple DBS check. Glaswegian, didn't you laugh anybody? Um, sorry, that's a terrible thing to say. Um, it's for the employer to actually um, request a certificate. If you want to get your own certificate, you can do that in Scotland, but in England, you have to set up a registered company and employ yourself. Um, and, and then sort of go, I'm about to employ this person as a director, can I have a, a certificate, please? Well, that's one of the few ways you can actually get to see your own thing. And again, depending on what level of um, certificate you want, a basic one pretty much just goes shows all the unspent convictions. Um, then you get the ones that show the spent convictions, then you get the ones that show police intelligence, the enhanced ones will literally sort of go, here's things you've been convicted of, here's things you've been acquitted of, here's spent convictions, and here's all the gossip in the police canteen about you. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Uh, they can, and there's a bit of a rumour as to whether or not you're entitled to know what's going on. So if someone says, I'm sorry, you go, well, I don't know. I literally, I've never been convicted of an offence in my life, I've never done anything, and it's like, yes, but the intelligence report says you hang around with these people. So, you know, basically, you're involved in a, a group that we think commits public order offences, or is subversive, or something like that, and that will be on the certificate. Uh, and things. See, I've not done the actual disclosure, so mm -hmm. that will be, be on there that I go to protest with them. Yeah, probably. Lady. <laughs> People say that we are listed as um, terrorists. Is that true? No. Now this is an interesting thing. Do you remember, like the policy ex policy exchange, which is theoretically it's a charity, it's a think tank. They released a report on extinction rebellion, that, uh, and it was 
It probably wasn't defamatory because it said some of these people could go beyond this and get involved in terrorist offences. Now that's a very nebulous thing and the big thing that says whether you can defame an organisation like that. But yeah, some people, it's probably fair to say, it's more people like Policy Exchange and the Daily Mail. But the one thing the police have been saying, and what I recommend is that about a month ago, they produced the Carnage Library, produced the report on public order offences, and there's all the evidence from the police there. And they're basically saying, we have stuff because these people don't do anything we can arrest them. They don't do anything. They are completely committed to non-violence. We, our police powers are limited. Literally, there's nothing we can do. It would be far easier if they were about to kick off because then we can take it up a level. But basically, this is massively expensive to police. It takes four people to carry one person off. They're as nice as pie. There's nothing we can do about it. It's hideously expensive. If you want us to do something about it, it's for you to legislate. We are not going to take this up. We're not going to get the TSG in. We're not going to turn up with shields and stuff. Because, and it is literally, they are saying, these people are committed to non-violent direct action. And there's not even any people on the fringes. There's not even anybody on the periphery. Yeah. What are the stats to 15 done for terrorist ads? Ah. Yes, but it's very interesting uh, in terms of what people have done that. And with have you noticed that they technically don't use, like, people, like, with the... Uh, Heathrow Port, that's Heathrow Port, not Extinction Rebellion, mm. and it's to try and disassociate, it's like, it's like, you know, it's a different brand, yeah. and things like that, but that's something, again, you might want to be, this is going beyond the law, but you might want to be careful, careful about what you do in terms of the branding. Extinction Rebellion and Animal Rebellion is very sort of fluffy and she-she and respectable at the moment, just edgy enough for the kids, but safe enough for you know, the growing up. I mean, this needs to be something you can send your kids on, and that's again something to look at about sending your children on demos and you know, social services and things. But yeah, um, currently the police's attitude, and they've been very public about this, is they do not think Extinction Rebellion, and presumably by extension, Animal Rebellion, there's anything to worry about apart from it's literally public order offence, minor public order offences that are completely symbolic. Uh, you know, they, they are not expecting any sort of trouble whatsoever, or you know, it's proper non-violent direct action. But again, these are all considerations. Your academic career, we covered that. You go to a four-year degree, one, one year of it requires some time spent abroad, especially post-Brexit. Will you be able to do it? Will you be able to get a visa? Because, like I said, spent convictions and things like that, visas, countries can set their own thing. They can say, you declare everything, spent convictions, every time you've been arrested, every time the police have spoke to you. And they might say, sorry, you're not coming in. Um, Travel and visas, refusal of entry. Japan's a very good... In Japan, they will check your phone for your social media. You've got to disclose it. They'll go through your Facebook. We spent two years setting up for some tidy people, creating fake, fake Facebook profiles. And I did one for a friend, and I set her up as the... Do you know the concept of the Weibo? These people are obsessed with Japanese culture and stuff. And it was really bad, so I spent three years... I think it was two or three years by the time she got over setting up this profile that made her look like just some complete sort of obsessed with J-pop and Japanese culture. No, to give her an excuse as to why she would be down there. And it was just like, and she was like, oh, I never, who are these people? These, I do not fancy these underage boys. And it's like, you know, you know, and it was all like literally posting J-pop stuff and going, my hero, he's such a heartthrob, he's so dishy and stuff, and she was fuming. But the Japanese will do that, they'll check your social media and then, I mean, I'm not picking on the Japanese here, but they will nick you at the airport, they're allowed to hold you for seven days without charge, and then put you back on the plane. And it's quite funny, because some of my friends got nicked, and they were whinging about the food. And they went, they kept us in there, and all they fed us on was, like, just rice and tofu. Mm. And how is that any different <laughs> to what you, to how you live anyway? It's, it's not the point, it's not the point. When I first started asking for social media accounts and stuff now, and yes, sir, they never used to, but... Who's that, sorry? America. Mm. They now ask for your social media yeah, it's quite funny because you know, like ICE obviously, bit of, I quite like all my art litigation, and ICE used to be the really nice people because they would assist us with all the Holocaust art and stuff, they would even, and all the uh, cultural artifacts. So when people were smuggling stuff out of like a lot of stuff was coming out of Zimbabwe towards the end because the government were just basically going, we need cash, have all our treasured artifacts and stuff, and ICE were bloody brilliant because they would literally nick things and they would nick them in particular jurisdictions that made life very very easy for getting the stuff returned so it's all wait and go well wait till they because if you nick him when he crosses the border in new york you better pop the call and that judge will instantly give you the order 
I was super annoyed at the like sending cautiously back and stuff. And so I used to like the, the, the good guys, and now it's like they're literally the Gestapo again. It's so weird. But yeah, social media is a big thing because countries can control their own borders. There's no, you know, you can spend lots of money with expensive immigration lawyers if you want, sort of going, I should not have been, uh, you know, barred from this country. But realistically, with the current climate and the current government over there, what judge is going to stick his neck out and go, no, no, you come in. You come in. Yeah, we'll overturn that decision of these experts who guard our borders and build our walls and stuff. So, yeah, that is an issue. And like I say, that can affect your sort of academic stuff if you've got any sort of part of your degree that involves foreign travel. So, yeah, refusal entry, social media, etc. Um, again, just looking at the time, because obviously I don't want to take up too much time, so this is all fantastic stuff. For organisers, civil liability. Uh, you all organise a big boycott of my veal truck. I don't get my veal across. I lose loads of money. What's your name, Miss? You organise that. Uh, conspiracy to injure. For like, you, you basically, uh, all the corporate law offences, uh, corporate law torts and stuff. I come after you personally. I sue you, I win in court because you stopped my profit, you're negligent, you should have known that your actions would ruin, you know, ruin my business, etc. I'll come after you, I'll get a judgment of more than £5,000, I'll bankrupt you, I'll have your house. Um, this is all stuff you need to worry about. Um, and we'll come on to the bit, I think I've, I've got all the talks next. Criminal liability. Basically, you're, you're, it's an organisation, you might be doing an organisation that effectively is encouraging people to commit offences. Uh, what we used to call incitement, we don't use the word incitement anymore, that vanished in uh, 2008. But uh, we'll come on to what the replacements are. And what we call incohate offences, uh, that's things like conspiracy, uh, aiding and abetting and stuff. Oh, I've lost my slide, right, I'll just go back. Uh, I'll go back on this. Da, da, da. Oh, right. Okay, civil liability, like we said, uh, basically you can try and hide behind creating sort of companies and that's one thing you might want to do organize everything set up a limited company do it as a community interest company limited by guarantee not shares have the nominal director maybe rest you know do a massive sort of thing have it owned by another company another company another company that's somewhere in a non-legano country legano is the convention that allows countries to enforce judgments in each other just basically do like companies do just insulate yourself completely organize everything through that so when they go right we're going to get an injunction against you, get the company, like Peach and Serge were potentially defendants in these injunctions, fight the injunction, let's say you lose it and you get your, because the rule in our courts are loser pays winner's costs, okay, you have to pay our £100,000 legal bill, this company, okay, good luck with that, <laughs> either enforce it or sort of go, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, we do a lot of uh, work in um, sort of, uh, you know, Estonia, so that's where this company's registered. Um, Companies do it all the time. Companies do it all the time. So why not? Why why should you take advantage? But if you are setting up a company that is de designed to effectively break the law, as opposed to like you know civil matters, they might just come after you. You can't use the corporate veil, as we say, as a shield for criminality. Otherwise, I would literally be saying, "Oh, Alan's post office robbery limited." <laughs> <laughs> we did look into it. Um, it doesn't quite work. So yeah, so you've got your criminal liability. Uh, first of all, incohate offences. Th those are offences where a crime hasn't been committed, but there was a prelude to a crime. The most common one is uh, conspiracy. Conspiracy is an agreement to where more than two people, two or more people, agree to commit a crime. Um, and it's the agreement is the offence. As soon as you've agreed to do it, that is, the offence is complete. You don't have to go beyond that. So me and you go right. Me and you let us go out tomorrow and trash that swear shop. As soon as I say okay. Yeah. Or just, no, I commit, you can commit a, you can engage in a conspiracy with a nod and a wink, is what they say. There has to, it has to, yeah. So you can't passively engage in a conspiracy, but it doesn't have to be written down. I, it's a big fishing case I did, the Buckland's conspiracy, and they literally minuted the conspiracy. That's how organised they were. But luckily it was Cornwall, so when they did the big raid to raid all the fishing fleet, all the fish merchants, that was the night of the big magnetic storm where every single computer and record had been wiped out almost as if they'd been put in microwave ovens. Because, of course, DEFRA had to go to the local magistrate to get the warrant, and it's Cornwall. Yeah, yeah, sure, you want the warrant? I'll be back in two minutes with this warrant. Right, yeah. Uh-huh, yeah, yeah. Just, just give it an hour. <laughs> <laughs> No, seriously, I mean, they, they were using the network that they used for the, 
was a maritime thing to report where all the they had a list of all the death of vehicles and it was like just going that you know they're in Devonport now they're in Brixton. If you had a conspiracy and I was in the news and I suspected something and I didn't do anything. No, unless it's a certain terrorist offences. We used to have a thing called misprision of fel felony, which was you know a crime is about to be committed and you don't report it. That was abolished in uh, about <laughs> ninety three or something, I think. But yeah, they used to, that used to be. There are certain tourist offences where it's an offence not to report, but generally speaking, no. You, you can be sort of very passive about it. Legally, if it turns out you're in the room when we were planning everything, good luck explaining that to the jury. <laughs> and there are certain things as well to do with, like, but rather old obscure things about if you're married or civil partners and your spouse or civil partner commits a conspiracy and things like that. One thing with the conspiracy is motives are irre 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 irrelevant. If, the, if, if it's just you and one other guy in a conspiracy, and the other guy was an undercover police officer, it's still a conspiracy. Okay, so be very, very careful of that um, and things. Um, aiding, abetting, counting, procuring, that's where basically somebody else is committing an offence and you assist them somehow. And that could be literally, you go for it. Yeah, yeah, or you lend them your car. So presumably a bit of a risk in like Extinction Rebellion meetings, even if you're one of the people who says, I don't want to get arrested, if you're in a meeting encouraging other people, even if you're not part of their plan, but you're saying, you go for it. Well, yeah, and you need to look at the joint enterprise case for this. Now, I know it seems that there's no parallel, but the stabbing cases, you were there, your mates went out, somebody got stabbed, you were with them, or somebody who felt, or, or the robbery cases, perhaps a better example. Gang of kids stand around to me, one guy goes, give me a fucking wallet. You're just stood there passively, but the guy's looking around going, whoa, had my wallet. What level, and again, it's all down to mens rea, what level of intent do you need? Because you being there, you're, if you're the person, well, I only did it because, like, you know, I had a bit of backup. You know, that's the thing. And yeah, you could passively encourage something. And this is why this is very relevant. I think you have to be very, very careful about the conspiracy offences. And like I say, I know they're all words, aiding, abetting, counselling and procuring. Aiding, abetting is just helping out. Counselling is giving advice, like what I'm definitely not doing, because I've kept with the bystanders board, and that's, I don't even know who you people are. Who are you people? Um, and, procur and procuring is basically, do the favour, go and rob that bank for us, uh, and things. Um, so they're the major ink incoherent offences. Serious Crime Act 2007. Uh, there are basically there are three, three offences, sections 44 to 46. They replace the old incitement offences. Again, I won't go into a lot of detail, but suffice it to say, those, are, those could make it an offence to basically encourage or assist somebody, either knowing a crime is going to be committed, believing a crime might be committed, or believing one or more types of crimes might be committed. And sec that's section 46. I, I, I have a little bet that there will be some section 46 prosecutions if things get out of hand, or if, you know, the government starts to go, this is just getting a little bit too. Because section 46 is basically, I said that the threshold's very low, and you don't have to say what crime was committed, you just have to say one of a, or, you, know, you don't have to sort of identify a place, you just have to sort of say a species of crime that may be committed. Um, and it, could be, and it could be just something like, we're having this discussion now, and I know you're all going to go out, and you're going to be up on the roof of Smithfield, and you're going to be spitting around blocking roads, and you're going to be doing that. I really, well, I don't know, because you may do this, and hopefully I haven't encouraged you, but let's say you sort of go, yeah, now I know all that, I feel a lot more confident about committing these offences. Luckily, they've tested knowing or believing, and they're using the same test as they do for handling stolen goods. Because handling stolen goods is knowing or believing they were stolen, and that's a, that's more than mere suspicion. So it's not enough that I suspect that any of you might do something. I have to pretty much be very much certain that you're going to do it. I have to I I have to either know you're going to do it or believe that you're going to do it. And believe is basically knowing you're going to do it, but then turns out you don't know it. Um, with all these types of things, it doesn't matter if the person doesn't commit the offence. The offence is just doing the encouragement, knowing or believing. It doesn't matter if nobody was going to do it, if the audience was full of undercover police officers. Um, if, if the thing was impossible, there's a difference between factually impossible and legally impossible. Come on, let's you and me, let's go block the M67. There isn't an M67. Doesn't matter, it's still an offence. But if it was something like um, attempting something that's impossible legally, tell you what, let's you and I, let's do a little conspiracy to engage in the importation of snow. It's actually illegal to import snow. 
I, I say that, that was a real case. They need somebody for, for, for it to report stuff. But anyway, it's not an offence. Yeah, yeah, but they thought it was. What if he <laughs> kill someone with voodoo? Ah, yeah. there are some cases. Yes, it's all getting very weird on that. Make sure, uh, and, you know, just make sure, do it so they die more than three years later. Because we don't have the year and a day rule. Because that's that great thing is about the Din Mac and the men of Derek Gore. He did the Din Mac and there he just, and he just died. What, there and then? No, 15 years later. That's the thing with Din Mac, you never know he's going to hit. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, the, 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 some of these, I love all these things. We once had a case where we were claimed for extra damages on a basically a boring lease type thing because he was a Feng Shui practitioner and the replacement building we had to get had bad Feng Shui and it's whether or not he's a place for that. <laughs> <laughs> not in Truro. Um, <laughs> yeah. Almost there, so I'll let Christopher do her bit. The other thing is, um, it's a youth movement, it's kids, Greta, outside, yeah, she's outside, bunking off school every day, you encourage your kids to do the same. What happens when you get nicked for like, encouraging truancy? Okay, basically, uh, this is something I used to do a lot of this, I must confess, these weren't people whose kids were protesting, these were people whose kids weren't going to school. It was also a bit unfair, because they also nicked their mum, you go, well, why haven't you nicked dad? Well, dad's not on the scene anymore, uh, anyway, you know, but you know, but anyway, they'd also nicked the, the mum. Uh, basically, if your kid doesn't attend school, and it's really bad, I do some stuff for service families, and it's really bad now, where they're not letting kids come out of school to meet the parents when they're on leave and things, and we've got a bit of a row going on about that at the moment. As to whether because they, they are coming down, you know, it's not like the old days where Tony Blair took his kids out of school on holiday and you go, Well, Tony Blair did it. Um, because Tony Blair did a lot of things. <laughs> it's like you say, Well, yeah, what, what if your client died a war? Oh, all right, all right, calm down. Um, but yeah, generally speaking, uh, if you like basically allowing your kids to bunk off school, especially if you're doing it regularly for some climate strike thing, theoretically, you breach all sorts of things under the Education Act. Um, there are various things they can do with their disposals, like parenting orders and education referral orders, which is there for parents who can't cope and stuff like that. Either for parents who can't cope and need a bit of hand just getting their kids to school or won't engage with the authorities, where it's like we're pretty much saying you must abide by these parenting classes. But realistically, the most common thing is you'll get... So it's called a fine. It's not actually a fine. It's again, it's called a fixed penalty notice. It's 60 quid, unless you don't pay, which case it may go up to 90 quid. Um, and it's basically your child's out of school and it's 90 quid per day. Um, and we've tried to argue and say, well, actually, if they bunk off all week, can that be a single offence? Uh, it's like, no, because they've got to go to school every day and then they go out to come home. <laughs> what if it's boarding school? Oh, stop it. Um, <laughs> one thing, so it's a 90 quid. If you don't pay that, if you don't pay the fixed penalty, then you can be prosecuted and it's a maximum two and a half thousand pound fine. So there you go. Taking your child got 14 months, if she comes to the uh, annual regalia on a weekend, that's not an offence. No, 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 no. No, because you're not taking her out of school or anything, no. I mean, there's all sorts of... If, you know, if, if this wasn't a fluffy movement, if you were taking somebody down on some black block anti-fan type yeah. thing, then there may be all sorts of, like, child protection issues and sort of, you know, child welfare action. And they're presumably not allowed to sit in the road if you're protesting, such as the lorries going through Ramsgate. Well, again, you see, because... Do you know what Section 8 proceedings are? Um, it's what they would call the old at-risk register. Yeah. If you're regularly putting your kid in front of like some 16-tonner, mm. eight-wheeler, then you may well find yourself getting proceedings under Section 8 as this is a child at risk. I've always told her to stay on the car, so yeah. she does. But, so at 18, is that 20, is it when she can do what she wants? Yeah, does? yeah. I mean, there's a thing called Gillick competence. Um, Gillick competence. Remember Victoria Gillick? She was the campaigner. Yeah, yeah. Are we all showing our age here? Is everybody going like, who are you? What are you on about? Uh, Gillick competence is basically, that all arose out of when kids were getting contraception advice without parents' advice. And they're going, well, it's illegal because they're under 18 and, uh, sorry, under, some are under, under 16 and therefore you're aiding and abetting um, unlawful sexual intercourse because they're kids. And they said, we look at basically every kid on a case-by-case -case basis. Some kids are really smart and make their own decisions doesn't get rid of age of consent and things like that, but in terms of parenting, and we get this all the time, my friends who do family law and stuff, it's like, I'm not gonna, I'm not, I'll make an order as to residence, but kids vote with their feet, and I'm not going to interfere with that. If they want to stay with mum or dad, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not getting involved. But yeah, for, for something like yourself, if you're taking your kids down there, then yes, you don't want social services involvement, because like I say, Section 8 proceedings have a bit of a stigma to them, and they can roll, you know, you, you, 
And your kids would have their own separate representation, and then you get these things called cast cast reports where they sit down and say, What does mummy make you do? Mummy, mummy, mummy uses you as a sacrifice for your hippie, just like that dresser's <laughs> parents. Honestly, it's an outrage, etc., etc. But anyway, that was a massively sort of run through things. There's loads and loads and loads of stuff. Uh, like I said, I'll put up some of the technical stuff about Rehabilitation Offenders Act and how that lo runs and all the sort of boring you know, stuff with graphs and charts and things. But does anybody have any specific questions arising? I'm interested what the Bar Standards Board told you because I've I've been hanging around with people who are, uh, you know, interested in getting arrested. I'm very sympathetic towards the cause, etc. Can't risk doing anything that would bring the profession into disrepute, etc. Because I'm already on the bar court. Um, I'm. Ah. Concerned about how much you can say, explain, or, or or even express. They said to me the the weird thing is they pretty much were more concerned about the uh, doing anything that would look like it compromised your independence. So when I was looking at doing some stuff for the website, what we said is I will put stuff on my website that anybody can link to, and then b basically I have to here's some law for activists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Whereas I could do stuff for like the I do the articles for Oxford Granimals and things like that. But they, they, they were more concerned about the non the appearance of lack of independence that you were sort of basically partisan. Yeah, it's a very weird thing. It didn't seem to make sense. But then they referred to uh, CD five, which is the not to bring the bar into disrepute. And the, but they, you know, I sort of went back. You know, sort of, you, 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 did you miss the unlawful bit? And basically, this is civil dispute. This is breaking the law in a small way. So my concern yeah, the way where officers of the court are sat. Yeah. Um, you know, we are, we are held to a higher standard, so you do have to be careful. I, mean, I might get away with it more, just, uh, I'm so annoyingly well known at the Bar Standards Board for various reasons. <laughs> I, 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 I went on a course a little while ago, and they sent me a thing, it was a last minute thing, and I went, ah, and they sent me an email and said, Baba said, you forgot, said, here's the vegan options menu, you forgot to mention you're vegan. They'll kick you out for that or something because they were so used to me whinging about. Because I, I had to do a form once. I thought that feedback form was anonymous, and they went, "Who else would be going? All you had was crisps and hummus." <laughs> 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 but yeah, okay. Uh, but no, they, um, basically, yeah, I would. I have written to them to come look else. I said, "This is what I'm doing." Any guidance, and they basically, as they always do, whenever you do anything with the bar standards board, they're really lovely people. But remember, it's not like the SRA where they've got full time people. They're volunteers, and they pretty much come back and say, "Use your best judgment." You've read the bar, you've, you've read the handbook, and it's CD five, which is literally one line saying, "You will not do anything to bring the profession into disrepute." And I suspect that <sighs> be interesting to see what the sanction would be, because they're, they're, they're a bit of a soft touch regulation, especially compared to the SRA. the SRA. Yeah, the SRA are absolutely evil. And my solicitor friends are terrified of them. So yeah. How did he get this far to giving drugs to his boyfriend that killed him? So the, 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 the scary thing is, you get all the stuff where you get really severe things for some regulatory, but all the fucking punch ups and groping people at the Christmas party is guidance as to future conduct. Seriously, have a look at that. Have a look at the sanctions, because I, I, I read the sanctions pages on the Bar Stands Board a lot. What if I see from there? <laughs> I do have my collection. I, I actually had a collection of letters from the Bar Board going that was, we have found no professional misconduct because I've, you know, get clients and people on the other side, especially in commercial stuff, you'll get people on the other side reporting you all the time. Mm. So, I yeah. seem dodgy. They didn't want to find Yeah, yeah. Had the audacity to act for somebody against me. And it, it's an outrage because I was telling the truth and he said, put this in for his client and the judge, it's all a conspiracy and they're all in it with the judge and they always get the standard. What was quite interesting is I read the first one and it's a really sympathetic letter back to the complainant and I thought, wow, they've really put a lot of effort into it. But then I got another one and it was literally identical, so they clearly just like clear <laughs> put the person's name in, you know, like the pro forma. But yeah, be, be careful be, and, and maybe just let them know. It's the old thing. I don't think we can, so as students, you can't like use the helpline or anything um, yet. You're just expected to abide by the rules. Have you printed out the handbook? Wait, we've got the handbook. Like that thing? Yeah. It's, well, it's a textbook. It's I've got the app. The I thought, because I didn't realise the app. <laughs> you. Um, you mentioned due to solicitors and the Green and Black Cross. Yes. Who advise, who, whose guidance is don't use a due to solicitor because often they're not versed in process law. Is that something <coughs> you think is correct? Uh, possibly so. Now, I'm hoping I'm going to speak to my friend Natasha McGurvich, who's supposedly the top criminal solicitor in London, and find out about this. But that is probably very, very true, actually. Yes. Um, 
the Duke Solicitor scheme as well, because it was a bit of a massive switch, because people wanted to be on the Duke Solicitor scheme because it was quite a nice earner for solicitors, and it was a panel, and the panel was Duke Solicitors, and there was a lot of scandal about who they would let on the panel because it was all very cosy. But yeah, I personally would advise that you have, there's a list of a few solicitors, and again, we've maybe put the list, like all the Binmans and Hodge Jones and Allen and people like that, who do specialise in these areas of law, and I think it would be worth sitting around for the extra sort of hour or two it takes to get there than going with a duty because somebody but again a duty solicitor if you just want to get weighed off very very quickly a duty solicitor who's got a nice little rapport with who's in that police station every week and knows everybody it's it's a decision that you might it's it's like you might want the person who gets on all right with the coppers and go back on with this case really you know but you've got him in the cells all hours can't you just unarrest de arrest him or go on the parents are coming now you know, it, 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 it's something that's beyond the scope of the advice, because it's... But, yeah, if you're up for anything sort of p proper sort of process law, I personally would say have research before you go down there and maybe get in touch with somebody and say, right, I'm doing this. If I'm arrested, who's on duty that night? Give us some phone numbers. I need to know that I can call you, and this is... Maybe this is something we need to look into without... Crossing the line, the preparation becomes a Section 46 offence, but maybe... I mean, the green and black people have the cards with the contact details on, and I personally would advise everybody... This is why I sort of mentioned about green and black. I personally would advise everybody to keep one of their little cards, because as much as I think they can be a bit antagonistic, their cards do have some pretty good basic advice, which is like, officer, I'm not going to say anything until my solicitor gets here, and they do have some good contact numbers on. So I personally would... I, I personally would give somebody like Binman's or Hodge Jones and Allenary. I think Alex Jones and Alan talk about this at that specialty for protest mm. law and who's been quite vocal about... Yeah, I've just realised I've just recommended some solicitors. No, I haven't. Lots of other solicitors are available <laughs> and things. I hold no particular breed for them. Other stuff. Yeah, no, I've, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, There are some solicitors out there who, who, who can do this sort of thing, so I don't recommend. Um, I've read that you can, um, if you pay some money, you can find out what you this is the DBS thing, Disclosure and Barring Service. No, it's different to that. It was like... Information? Oh, no. It's not Detective Success? Like, can you, can you, ah, can yes. you hold on me? Yeah, I yeah. think so. Yeah. Um, but then I was just wondering, if does it look like, if you then request that, does it look suspicious and they're going to be like... Possibly so, but <laughs> the one thing to remember about subject access requests is there are a whole host of exemptions, and one of them is... Uh, detection and prevention of crime and if you ask them say what intelligence do you hold on they, they always go uh, we're not going to tell you because um, and, and, and they don't even do a they, they can actually do a we neither deny nor confirm that we hold any anything on on you yeah. because obviously by saying we are not releasing this information under the exemption it's pretty much saying yes we've got this information on you so yeah but um it's it's, it's worth doing because they're free now Subject access oh, requests. Okay. Yeah, they you, you, you used to be like you've got you've got to pay. But also, uh, if it would cost more than six hundred quid to give you the information, they don't have to give you it. So target your. I mean, for something like what information do you have on me? That to an organisation might be quite sort of, you know a fairly easy request to comply comply with. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, Edith, who unfortunately is tied up on something else. I mean, uh, Advocates for Animals. One of their specialities is. Freedom of information requests, subject access requests, and things. So yeah, um, it is a way of doing it. But just like I say, in practical terms, they're not going to sort of go, yeah, yeah, we, we're tapping your phone, and that guy at the end of the street is one of the, is sat in a car all day. Is one of our guys. Uh, oh, and by the way, you know Bob, who keeps some of your meetings. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That'd be great if they did. <laughs> be nice if they did. It's really honest, officer. It was like, of course, yeah. sorry, you really don't. And in terms of myths, like, you're under. Are you an undercover cop? You have to tell me. Yeah. No, they don't. <laughs> Is there an exemption as well that says if it's something really upsetting that they wouldn't... I subject that to request with my doctors and hospital notes, so I've read through it a few times, and I thought there was something about if it was something that was going to cause you significant distress. Oh. So if I was a police officer and I'd written, like, I'd implicated in, I don't know, like, just something on your that application that I thought I set in the yard. Oh, I don't know, because that, that's a well beyond my thing. Maybe I'm making it up. But I thought, just that came to my head. That's so interesting. I, mean, well, no, I, I, honestly, I honestly don't know. I don't, I, yeah. I, I, I don't know. I've got a friend who just made Meg, but I don't even think that would be. Uh, 
Mm. There's a really good firm on, uh, I can't remember the name of the firm, they're on Henrietta Street, just off Covent Garden. They do all the medical messages and stuff and medical defence unions, so they might know. Mm. But I've got no idea, yeah, I've no idea about that. Mm, thank you. Oh, go on, fight, arm wrestle. Sounds <laughs> nice. Um, when it comes to like trying to safeguard against people infiltrating uh, in the States at the Animal Liberation Conference that happened, um, they had this thing where basically you have to sign something saying you're not going to use the information to, against the group and also they announced it um, public, like to the crowd as well. Is that effective and can it be used here? <laughs> um, arguably you could use it against non-police officers, you could, you could just have a non-disclosure agreement, but you will recall that it's uh, because of all this stuff about with all the Me Too thing, that it's an exception to a non-disclosure agreement to breach it to reveal evidence of wrongdoing. So you cannot, yeah, so basically for public policy reasons, because it's the same reason, going, you must not tell everybody, here's your, it's like I was sort of, you know, molesting everybody in the office, and you go, well you've breached the NDA, well of course I have, because it's evidence of wrongdoing, and we go to all this public interest disclosure acts, it's work related, but you could do an NDA, it would not be binding against a police officer, otherwise we'd all do it, yeah. uh, and things. Arguably, could you uh, set something on, say it's commercially sensitive information? Uh, it'd be interesting that, probably not commercially sensitive because you're a, an activist organisation. You, you could draft NDAs, you could draft NDAs, but oh, apart from anything else, you'd have to, if somebody breached the NDA, you'd have to show that you suffered loss or damage from it and that's economic loss so what's your economic and financial loss yeah i guess you could structure it so that yeah yeah we, uh, <laughs> yeah uh, george soros and all our globalist backers didn't pay me that week because we didn't do yeah i mean i've got god so fun to do that wouldn't it people. but no i mean that's the trouble you could set up an nda uh in practice it wouldn't have any effect against law enforcement for obvious reasons um and arguably it wouldn't even effects within within the group would it kind of cut out basically or make people think twice about giving some information you know like one thing you can do is you can protect confidential information and confidential information is generally protected anyway but if you highlight it and get people to sign it makes it stronger uh, so you could sort of go as not to really be the identity of any group be people because you, you know if you're not doing any wrongdoing but you just don't want people to know you would have a reasonable expectation of privacy if you were meeting people covertly and expressly saying, I don't want people to know about my involvement in this group and I'm not breaking the law or anything. I just don't want people to know because it's, you know, political views are a protected, you know, sort of protected area and stuff that you're not supposed to disclose unless people voluntarily put them forward. But yeah, it's an interesting idea. I mean, you know, they do the mafia thing and just go like, here, go shoot that guy. But that's possibly not quite the non-violent direct action yeah. sort of thing with vibe we're going for. So yeah, probably not. But and also, all, all joking apart, uh, the mere fact that a police officer engages or commits a crime, technically speaking, they don't have blanket immunity, but it doesn't necessarily stop the evidence being admissible. Right, very very quick. I'm assuming Christabel's time, so this is probably going to overrun a little bit. Uh, hopefully, people got too much to do. Um, it, Entrapment, okay? General rule of entrapment, a massive area. The only rule that makes it inadmissible and an abusive process is if they encourage somebody to do an offence that they would not have done but for the encouragement. Uh, and they all say, it's, did you give somebody an opportunity to apply themselves to the trick or did you apply the trick to them? So if I basically go, uh, I'm a drug, I mean, classic drug dealing, that's the obvious one that people go for. If I basically am a drug dealer and a cop comes up and goes, I saw some drugs mate, and I go, there you go, that's not entrapment because I would sell drugs to anybody. If I pester somebody for three weeks, like, okay, okay, I can't go myself because I don't know. But you, the guy over there, can you go buy some drugs off him, please? That would possibly be entrapment because you would not have committed that offence but for my encouragement. But I mean, it's quite interesting all the um, McLeibel stuff and all the steel case that turned out. You know, the guy who wrote the guy who wrote the leaflet that got him to bother what's wrong with McDonald's was the undercover cop, and that was yeah. very interesting. That sort of we'll find out what twenty years, twenty thirty years later. God, I don't know. Um, and so, but yeah, basically, what, what the police. Was that one, eh? You remember McLeibel well, from that, Forever? Yeah. Yeah. And so, and it was all about that leaflet, what's wrong with McDonald's, and yeah. they found that some of it was defamatory and some of it wasn't, and it turned yeah. out that. Yeah. 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 Well, the guy who wrote the leaflet was the undercover copper, the one who knocked the lasso. Oh, really? Yeah, <laughs> so there you go. Oh. Wow, there's a book there, or a film, or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know, it just goes to show, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, so. But yeah, entrapment. Presumably that was normal. 
Like everybody involved in the protest, not it? No, 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 no. We only found that out when all this stuff about the undercover police and the relationships and the oh, stuff right. came out that they found out that one of the guys who was one of the undercover police officers who sort of got some repayment turned out to be the guy who'd written the, the, the right. leaflet that he got. Police knew about this all the time. The police would have known about it, or somebody within the police yeah. would have known about it, yeah. Uh, but yeah, entrapment and things, it's something, but like I said, the, what you need to be careful of is that if you do suspect anything, you know, make sure that person explicitly goes, what, are you saying we should do X? Because that's not really something that we'd be minded to do, you know. That's no, not, that, that's not really something, I, I'm sorry, you, I'm, I'm very much not in favour of that. Oh, go on then, you persuaded me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's it, seriously, that's the way you'd have to do it. You would have to make it very, very clear that you would not have committed that offence but for their encouragement. Okay, so, yeah, so, you know, start, start menacing the conspiracies. <laughs> or maybe not, I don't know, encrypt them or something. Don't forget, uh, if you do encrypt things, it's an offence not to give somebody a key for your encryption, regardless of anything, it's two years. So it's like, excuse me, well, you know, we've got authority, we've gone off to the chief constable, he said, we want access to your encrypted files, and it's, a, it's an offence not to give them the key for it. Mm -hmm. And regardless of what's in there or why they're doing it, so it's something. Right, any others? Uh, just, just a point, I, I, I read somewhere where the police, you know, on arrest you might take your telephone or yeah. things like that. Presumably, uh, yeah, yeah. just take it, but yeah, 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 they have no access to it. Uh, well, no, they, they, they can go off and say we want um, access to the encryption. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. And